thank you uh, to the bank for um, inviting us to give a talk. I was a research fellow visiting the bank, and uh, it's been a really enjoyable time, and I've learned a lot, so thank you for hosting us. And I think the title of uh, the conference brings together many fields who now, if, if there is a slow in globalization, there's clearly getting globalization of research themes. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. This is a paper uh, that's joint with uh, Thomas um, and Ralph. Thomas is here. Um, and the question we are asking is how carbon pricing affects firms uh, in the production network. So I'm going to first start by giving you the motivation for this research question and define a bit better what our research question is. I'll tell you about the data. I'll give you some descriptive uh, results that are also uh, really interesting because of the opportunity that the Belgian data offers. And then I'll show you uh, our results and then the road ahead of other questions we are hoping to answer um, with this framework. So to start um, my, our motivation, um, carbon pricing is uh, not something that is going away. Uh, it's often put into question of how efficient, how useful um, the European carbon market is or you know, the, the, in the public discourse there's a lot of mixing between voluntary carbon markets and um, regulatory carbon markets and questioning how valid they are. But what I wanted to show you to start with is that carbon pricing is on the increase globally and that it's not something we can expect will um, evaporate. So starting in 1990 to 2024, the share of global emissions that is uh, covered by carbon pricing has been increasing and now reaches about 25 percent. Um, the, the first jump you see there in 2005 is the introduction of the EU ETS. Then um, in 2013, Japan introduced a carbon tax and then China introduced some form an, of an emissions trading system um, and the EU ETS has been expanding its remit and so has uh, the Chinese. Um, and, you know, other countries are introducing this. And I, and I think, you know, being in Belgium, uh, we're really at, at the core of um, what has been the, the, the starting point of carbon pricing really through the EU ETS. And um, I'm sure there are some people from the European Commission. I think that it's quite incredible when you think about it that uh, what was started as a market that no one believed would really last long has now gone through two recessions, a pandemic, and, and a huge energy crisis and uh, energy-related war. So, and through that, the UETS is still uh, alive. And um, I'll tell you more about the ETS, uh, the European ETS shortly. Um, globally, the, of course, you know, while I'm showing you this great picture, the, the difference between carbon markets is, is around the world is quite different. So there are some, are, some of the carbon pricing happens through uh, trading schemes, others through taxes, some are in developing. Um, the EU is introducing a carbon border adjustment mechanism, so to, and I'll tell you more. And, um, and the variation of prices is also quite big. So on the map on the right, you see in the EU, uh, we now have a high price, but this isn't the case for the other uh, carbon markets. However, overall, the, if you take the average carbon price globally, it's going up. Uh, but it will range from less than a euro to, in some uh, place, uh, some countries that combine taxes with carbon pr uh, markets, 151 euros. And but so only one percent of global emissions are priced above what the World Bank would call a recommended carbon price for decarbon to drive decarbonization. So, you know, while the first picture of, yeah, carbon markets are exploding, we, we're still not at a level that where we think it might be sufficient to, to drive carbon prices. 
However, in the EU, you know, th this is the picture of uh, the price in the EU ETS from 2005 to uh, 2023 and beyond, where what we've seen is a very stable price for the first few, uh, for the, at least the middle phases of the EU ETS, uh, but a big increase uh, since 2017, and even more recently um, driven by many different forces, um, which would require a whole talk and paper, which I won't get into. So I'm just going to take, for the sake of this presentation, the price increase as given. Um, some of what is driving it is the EU uh, shrinking its cap, and looking for, forward, so this is to, tw to 2024, to 2040, um, reducing EU emissions to, to zero. And what looking forward also a carbon border adjustment mechanism, meaning that countries who um, export to the EU uh, would be facing a carbon tax at the border. So looking forward, the price on the ETS is not likely to go down. And um, however, despite this uh, increasing price and increasing presence of carbon markets, many emissions are not yet covered by carbon pricing. And therefore, there, there, there are still many aspects that policymakers and researchers need to ask themselves. So one is, you know, what, what does it mean economically that not the whole economy is covered by a carbon price, and this is obviously important for uh, policy design. The current emissions trading schemes, what is their reach? And we'll come to that. Um, when, emission, when emissions are uh, under a carbon price, do they leak to other sectors or other firms? Our work in uh, earlier um, papers looking at earlier years of the uh, carbon market don't signal any uh, leakage, but this was before the big uh, price increase we've uh, been witnessing. Um, who bears the cost of the policy? Is it the consumers? Is it the firms? Um, and therefore, are they just passing on the cost? Importantly for, for me is um, the, the carbon market really should hopefully act as an incentive to innovate and to change the way we produce things and the, way, and, and the goods that um, we therefore consume. And again, early work, including by Antoine, who's in the, the audience, have shown that carbon pricing has been driving up clean innovation, but is this still the case or even more the case and where uh, in the economy is this clean innovation happening? Is it also driving clean investment? Um, and um, could there be other types of uh, emissions trading design that, that could be as efficient or more efficient? And then again, uh, what will be the impact of uh, CBAM and how should it be designed? So I've given you a long list of what research, quest what research questions could be, but you know, we chose only a subset of these. Um, and you know, hopefully there's a research agenda for many others to uh, contribute to. So one question is, does the carbon price propagate? Um, and how does the, uh, the second question we've asked the data is how does the ETS impact the structure of the network? So if uh, a firm is uh, paying a carbon price, is that going to affect uh, how its suppliers or how its clients um, react and how many clients and suppliers it has? And then uh, is innovation uh, or investment impacted not only by it, within ETS firms or higher up it, uh, or further down in the production network. Um, so I'll try to answer these three questions um, here. The literature on emissions trading system is, is rather large. Um, the, the literature finds that the ETS has led uh, emissions to reduce um, to be reduced in, in, in treated firms, 
and find, finds no competitiveness effects. Uh, again, you know, researchers have been looking at early years, but there's uh, um, upcoming research that, sh that is showing sometimes some heterogeneous results depending on the sector or country of analysis. Um, and uh, there's also be, the literature has looked at the channels to explain the effects. For example, in France, we find that firms subject to the ETS invested more, and, um, and in particular into uh, clean production uh, technologies. There's also, um, a, um, as Emmanuel said, and it has been the driver, a large um, uh, literature on network effects, um, and both on price effects or supply side, and there's some uh, recent research on how uh, network effects uh, might affect, from a theoretical point of view, the effectiveness of carbon pricing. And then, um, yeah, a, a other production network-based research in other areas. So briefly, because um, you've now spent a day and a half here, I hope you're starting to know about the data. <laughs> but uh, we um, use annual accounts and the production network available at the NBB, to which we uh, match two extra data sets. One is PATSTAT, which is a data set that uh, classify that first records uh, patenting activity and uh, will have a um, classification on whether an innovation is green or brown. Um, and second is the carbon market data. So the EU uh, produces a publicly uh, available data set of all the uh, production facilities and the firms that are part, that, that are, uh, have to report their emissions and produce uh, emission allowances to cover their, their emissions. Um, so combining those uh, different data sets um, allows us to, to show uh, many different uh, descriptive statistics, but just to, to show you a few. The first one is how um, ETS firms, although there are only, there, there are about 300, depending at which sectors you look at, 300 firms roughly um, in Belgium who are part of the carbon market. And if you have good eyes, these are the green uh, dots on this um, sample of 2,500 firms. And the lines in between these firms are all their transactions um, in the, uh, in the B2B uh, data set. And if we look at um, upstream, we see, and, and we draw extra green lines for anyone who is uh, supplying an ETS firm, we see that 27% of Belgian firms are actually supplying an ETS firm. And if you go one degree further, you see that you know, it, the, the picture becomes very green. Uh, and on the downstream, it's, it's the same. ETS firms uh, supply uh, themselves uh, 20, close to 27% of firms. And at the second degree, again, uh, a very strong embeddedness of the ETS. And also, it makes quite nice artwork. I hope you, you agree. <laughs> um, so this means, because of this indirect exposure to the ETS, it means that in some sectors, uh, it might seem that they are very uh, uh, unaffected by the ETS. But once you ta take a picture of the, their suppliers and clients, it becomes a, a much larger share of firms. So, Take, for example, pharmaceuticals. Um, they have less than 5% of pharmaceutical firms that are um, in the ETS. But uh, once you look at their exposure, uh, either as a supplier to an ETS firm or having an ETS client, this goes up to, to close to a, a 50%. OK. so. Um, the questions uh, we are asking are I, I, those I will present to today. There are, th there are three main results I will show you. The first one was, uh, and for all three, I'm going to we're going to take this design. We look at the, how exposed 
uh, a firm is to the ETS in 2012, based on that data. And then we look at how different outcomes are changing between 2013 and 2017 and the years after that. Um, and so we, by basing things in 2012, we are sort of isolating the, the structure of the firm at that point in time and looking at how the increase of the price is affecting the firm. And so we start by looking at product prices. So this would be really the first order question is, if I'm hit by uh, an increasing carbon price, am I going to increase the price of my products for my clients? And um, we, we look at um, a composite uh, price index uh, and how it increases through, through time uh, by basing it, as I said, in the mix of products in 2012. And while we don't find any significant effect on prices, we do find, um, and we were hoping to extend this, we do find that in 2019 and 2020, this effect is slightly bigger, but still uh, not significant. So, of course, it begs the question, well, if firms are not increasing the prices, how would you as a researcher think that it's going to affect um, their, their clients, for example, or even their suppliers? So. You know, of course, there are many other ways in which a firm in, a, in its production network might be affected rather than the price. It can change suppliers, it can change the product or the inputs it is using, um, and it can change the products it is uh, producing, for example. So we start by um, looking um, at, a, at the, 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 the bigger picture is, you know, has, have firms, if they haven't changed their price, have they changed their value added, their employment, their investment, their exports, their imports? And actually we find on average, again, so, you know, um, the next few months we will be looking at different sectors, different types of firms, at different years, but on average uh, we find no direct effect um, of the being in the ETS, neither of having a high share of purchases from ETS firms and neither from having a high share of sales to ETS firms. Um, so then we think, okay, um, if we're not finding that, uh, could it be that they are changing the, that, that the share, the, that, that they are changing their, um, network. So are they buying from new firms or selling to, to new firms? So we started just, you know, out of interest, we had never worked with the B2B data, just to see, you know, on average, how um, many new suppliers does a firm have? And by new supplier, uh, we, uh, we, we could probably try with more years, but we thought a supplier is new or a client is new if I've not sold or bought from that firm in the past four years. So that would be a new supplier. And we see that on average firms have about 20% of their clients are new every year and about 25% uh, of their suppliers are new. But on average, ETS firms, so those that are part of the carbon market, are, are, have slightly less new clients and less new suppliers. Um, however, what we see is that from 2013 to um, the, the years after the price increase, the, while the firms that were directly in the carbon market um, being in the carbon market didn't increase your share of new suppliers or new clients. However, if you are, you, a large share of your purchases uh, was from ETS firms, well, you increased the, the new suppliers that you are having. Uh, this could be, for example, because you were not able to um, negotiate keeping uh, th that your supplier might have wanted to increase their prices because they are in the ETS, but you just switched suppliers, so you're, you're, having, you're changing your suppliers to non-ETS firms within Belgium, and the same for having a larger share of clients that are ETS firms, 
firms also then increase their new suppliers. So it could be that they are going to uh, supply new products to new clients and therefore need new types of suppliers. So this is, um, this is evidence that the ETS um, can have uh, impacts that are not al always the one you would think that it's going to redefine uh, the type of network and the ty type of economic links between firms um, through either the, 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 the input uh, necessities or the product design. Um, so then, um, as I told you, I think innovation is a really uh, important part of um, the mechanism that a policy maker would hope a carbon market uh, would, would um, drive. And so one, one, we look at this in the Belgian data and we find indeed that the first uh, line here shows you, um, confirms earlier findings in the literature that being part of the ETS increases your total patenting um, when the price increases and also increases your patenting of, of clean or green uh, patenting when the price increases. And interestingly, we, we find that firms that are selling a big share uh, to ETS firms are going to increase their share, uh, their, the number of clean patents um, they, they, uh, they file um, after the, the price increase. So to conclude, um, we we need to look beyond regulated firms and think uh, more broadly about the impact in the production uh, uh, network. And um, our first results suggest no evidence of cost pass through in the, the Belgian economy on average, uh, nor any effect on value added and employment. But it, we, find, we do find an impact on the extens extensive structure of suppliers and clients, and that a higher share of sales to ETS firms lead to an increase in clean innovation. So the road ahead is long, and, um, and, and there's plenty of opportunities for more research and more um, innovation. Uh, looking, for example, at a wider variety of indicators, more outcomes, um, and looking at um, the, the, also the non-domestic part of the network through importers um, and exporters. So thank you very much. Thank you.